who um, the idea of this panel is each person is going to take five minutes and is going to give you one advocacy idea something that you can take away look bottom line here is that um, we have a movement and I hate to call it that because the animal movement in this country just moves backward and so I hate to keep calling it a movement but we have an animal movement that has become eviscerated and infantilized and we've told people that the way to deal with the problem of animal exploitation is to write a check to some corporate entity that's going to take care of it for you and the answer is it's never going to work it's never going to change things are never going to change as long as you're writing checks and sending them to corporate welfare charities they're not going to end anything they're going to keep on perpetuating what they need to perpetuate to make sure you keep writing checks if this is going to change and it can change if this is going to change it's going to change because all of us all of us we need to get rid of this concept of leaders we need to get rid you all have to become leaders if this is something you believe it's got to be in your heart it's got to be in your soul and you've got to go out there and educate you got to educate yourself first but then you got to educate everybody you can in a creative nonviolent way that's how we're going to change things no, change will not occur in any other way you people have to do it we have to do it together it's a, it's something it's a it's a communitarian exercise none of us alone can can do it all of us together must do it so we've got people here today some of them I am happy to say are moderators um, on the abolitionist approach Facebook page and I wanted to tell you we have if you go to abolitionistapproach.com, which is uh, our primary website, we've got lots of free resources there for you to use. Like, you know, you can print, you can download cards. Where's Peggy? Peggy. We have howdoigovegan.com cards where, you know, you can print them out, you can cut them, you can give them to people so that when you have a conversation with people, um, you can, you know, you can give them a, a, a website so they can get all the information they want. We've got the Abolitionist Approach pamphlet, which you can print out. It's two colors. If you don't want to do two colors, you can print it out just in, you know, in black and white. And we've got it in, I think, 25 languages now. Uh, and, you know, so, I mean, you can print it out, you can distribute it to people. Um, but there's, we, there's all sorts of resources that we have available. And we've got the Facebook site, uh, the Abol Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach, where I and my wonderful moderators interact with people. And, um, and you know, and, and we try to educate people. People come on, they ask questions. Sometimes, sometimes they are harsh and nasty and rude. And that is why God created delete buttons. But, um, but anyway, so we have that, you know, available if you want to interact with me or with them there. Uh, Anita, Anita Moose um, is somebody who was on, on my page for a while. And I invited her to become a moderator because all of her comments were so incredibly sharp. Um, and um, she is a wonderful person. She lives with her partner and her children in Mumbai, India. She is a pilot. Uh, she, she is the person who flies these monster airplanes that we all travel on. And I have to tell you, the other night at dinner, um, I was asking her about the autopilot system. And she told me, well, you know, I have to tell you, the autopilot system is great. But if anything goes wrong, the autopilot system is the first thing that goes. So when you really need it, you don't have it. As somebody who is somewhat anxious about flying, this did not make me happy. I have to tell you. Anyway, Anita, talk to us. Hello again. Hi. Okay. So uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, vegan advocacy and, and the wonderful thing about this is that uh, you can do it anywhere and at any time but it does require you to be prepared yourself so that you can actually pass on a coherent message to somebody else and how do we do this? So I have a sort of uh, checklist sort of thing that you know you need to go down and make sure you cover all, all bases. So, um, 
when we are talking, it's usually very easy to get an opening. People, like Gary says, love to talk about their dogs, their cats. They love to talk about how they're animal lovers and uh, also, you know, um, how they love food. So all of, all of these are great openings. So what do you do once you do get one of these openings? So um, you, should, you should, I think, be prepared to read a lot and educate yourself because if, if you don't know what you're talking about, people are confused. Many of them really don't understand abolitionism and uh, they need to be very, very clear on the theory. And to be able to do this, we have all got to learn how to read again and uh, read books. There are wonderful resources out there. Uh, there are books by Professor Francione and uh, Professor Charlton. Eat Like You Care is great and uh, that's a great starting place for everyone to begin and it answers a lot of basic questions people do have that and, and then we have our own uh, pamphlets brochures these are all great resources we need to learn how to use them so go back and read and uh, what I, I also like to talk about is that we have to give out our contact information to people so that if somebody does not understand something, they can get back to you. And you have to be able to, uh, you know, be willing to put in the time and effort to find out the answers you do not know and get back to them so that, you know, they will take you seriously. So that's the second thing. And uh, always be ready to carry reference materials and hand them out to people because you have a limited amount of time with people. So you could probably tell them things and uh, when you hand out these brochures and pamphlets they go back home, they read them, it reinforces what you've already told them and it also could cover potential areas you might have missed. So that's, that's always a great thing to do. And I think Peggy here will, uh, will talk about this in more detail and she has everything beautifully organized. And uh, another thing is you know, people ask very, very basic questions and, and things that are perfectly obvious to you. But you have to be patient and understand that everybody does not understand veganism. In fact, some of the people I talk to have never heard the word, word vegan. So, so there are a lot of confused questions out there. You have to be patient. You have to begin at the beginning with people and take the time to really explain things. And uh, another thing that is very, very important, and, and this is something uh, that I cannot stress on enough, do not ever change the message. Do not change the message because somebody is more concerned about diet or is doing it for the environment. You have to be clear that veganism is the moral baseline, you know, and uh, that treatment is never the issue. Use is the issue, we have to keep that extremely clear and also at all times we have to get over our, our own apprehension of how people will react to what we are saying. We are here to do this for the animals, they need us and I think it is absolutely essential that we get over our own discomfort and go out there and do it. Grassroots vegan advocacy is the way to do this and I would encourage each one of us to go out and do, do exactly that. Thank you. Next up is Peggy Warren. I met Peggy last year at the first World Vegan Summit, and she and I ended up sort of spending um, a lot of the time that you know I was not speaking. We were in sort of a little group talking, and she was so full of uh, ideas about things that she thought she could do and, and, and things that she wanted to do. I couldn't resist asking her to be a moderator on the page and she has um, been terrific. Not only is she a great moderator in terms of interacting with people, but she's really creative when it comes to designing resources and helping us spread the word. So I will now introduce you to Peggy Warren. If I can see over the podium. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about everyday opportunities and everyday advocacy that we can all do and uh, with just a little preparation anybody can do uh, everyday advocacy and take advantage of an every opportunity uh, an everyday opportunity uh, which can last this can something this is something that can last five seconds 
maybe five minutes. Usually you're interacting with a stranger, uh, but with just a little tiny bit of pre uh, preparation, anybody can do this and everybody should do this. So how does this work exactly? Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to be prepared. And in order to be prepared, uh, it's, it's really pretty simple. I, I basically have two things. I keep how do I go vegan cards with me and abolitionist approach pamphlets with me everywhere I go. So I know that I always have my materials with me everywhere I go. Uh, the second thing you need is you just need to have a really good attitude. You need to believe that people really want to learn about veganism. Uh, it's something that's a very exciting message that uh, people are going to be receptive to. And don't be afraid to smile when you approach people and want to talk to them about this. So once you are prepared and you have your opportunities uh, all ready to go and you have your attitude on, all you have to do is you have to look for these opportunities. And, and they are literally everywhere. You can do them, I mean, you, you would be amazed at some of the things. I've been in the dentist chair with cotton balls in my mouth and been talking to the dentist. So I mean, there's nowhere you can go. And so just a few examples are um, anywhere that you work, play, or socialize, when you're out jogging, walking your dog or other non-human refugee, when you stop at the bank, if you're talking on the phone with like a customer service rep, visiting the library or a bookstore, grocery shopping, which happens to be one of my favorite places to accost people, um, waiting in the veterinarian's office, if you're riding on a bus, train, or plane, eating in a restaurant, shopping for non-food uh, food items, buying gas for your car, uh, visiting your local food bank, or uh, even in a vegan establishment. If I hear someone behind me talking about veganism or enjoying their food, I always turn around and introduce myself and tell them about the How Do I Go Vegan website and the abolitionist approach and give them a pamphlet. So basically what I'm saying is once you start thinking of it in this way, you're going to find opportunities beyond your wildest imagination. Uh, but of course, the most important thing is you have to act. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a casual acquaintance or total strangers, which I approach all the time, you have to act in order to make this connection. So I wanna talk about just a couple of examples of uh, what uh, some of the things that I have done recently and some of them are really simple uh, for example going to the bank drove up to the bank window did my little transaction and the teller said is there anything else I can do for you <laughs> <laughs> and I said well yes as a matter of fact there is I said I would like you to go vegan oh, yeah. and, <laughs> and so <laughs> She said, oh really? And I said, as a matter of fact, I have a little pamphlet and a card that I would like to give to you. And I had it ready in my lap and I put it in a little tray and she sucked it right in and started looking at it. And she said, thank you very much. I am so happy to get this. <laughs> uh, last week uh, is another, another one. I had, to, uh, I had to buy a piece of furniture and I had been waiting all uh, uh, summer for our furniture sale to have their big annual sale. So I went uh, doodling down there and I talked to the sales rep. The first thing I said when I walked in is, uh, now I want you to understand that I am vegan and I don't even want to see anything that's leather. And he said, well, that's fine. So he showed me around and he chatted and we talked about the different items. And in the process of our conversation, he happened to mention they had a dog. And he said, uh, this particular fabric is one that I have and the dog hair doesn't stick to it. And I said, aha. So I filed that away in the back of my mind and we finished our transaction and before I left I said, you know, uh, I understand uh, that you have a dog, you mentioned having one and, and I love dogs, as a matter of fact I love all animals, which is why I'm vegan. <laughs> and we started talking about a little bit and he was very, very receptive and I ended up giving him a How Do I Go Vegan card and an abolitionist uh, approach pamphlet. So. I mean, these are everywhere, but probably my favorite place that I like to approach people is in the grocery store. 
And when I go in my grocery store, we don't have a lot of options where I live. So I basically go to the produce section and ignore the rest of the store. So I see people in the produce section and I will walk up and say, wow, the kale really looks fabulous today. And I said, uh, I would say something like, um, you know, I really like getting uh, all of these great vegetables that we have here because I live on this kind of food. And I see that you have a lot of great vegetables in your cart. Do you happen to be vegan? And sometimes people will say, well, no, or maybe I'm thinking about it, or maybe I'm almost there. So, of course, I start talking to them about the How Do I Go Vegan website and why they should consider going vegan. I give them an abolitionist approach pamphlet, and we they smile, they're receptive. I almost never get someone that's, that is not interested. People are very receptive. They want this information. They, they are hungry for this information. And all we have to do is just to go out and make a five second connection, a couple of minutes of chatting, whatever it takes, you can, you can get that information out there. It's easy to do. It's something that we should all do. So all we have to do is just be prepared, look for opportunities, and act. It's something that all of us can do. It's something that uh, we should be doing. And it's something that we owe the animals because we, we really need our vegan world and the animals really need our voice. So every time we connect with someone, it's making one more little seed, one more little connection, and is one more step toward our vegan world. So get out there and get everyone to go vegan. I hope you listen to that because she's basically given you a complete recipe for how you can get out there. I mean, look, you know, if ever you make a plane reservation in which you have to order a meal, if you can't turn that into a vegan moment where you get involved in a discussion, restart the conversation. I mean, you know, you can do all this stuff. It's really quite easy. Uh, there you go. See, I mean, she's just like, I love her. You can't stop her. She's just wonderful. I mean, she just she's doing it. But that's that's the right way to think. That every interaction you have is an interaction which you can turn into an educational opportunity and, a, and, a, and an opportunity to talk about veganism. Next up is Amelia Lee. Amelia was a student at Rutgers Law School in the 1990s. Um, she did not take a course from me. I never wanted to ask why because I thought it would be an awkward moment. Nevertheless, I mean, in certain ways it doesn't really matter because she's now come around to truth. Um, and, and, you know, in many ways, and I have to respect her for the fact that, you know, she's come around even though she didn't have me as a teacher. But, and any, and she's, she is, she's a, she's a lawyer. Um, she is an American, but she lives in London. And she's terrific. She has been very, very helpful. She's a font of endless, she, when I have an idea, I, I know nothing about technology. She knows a lot about it. So whenever I have a technical question, she's my sort of go-to person. Um, and she's always helpful. And she has helped me in coming up with a lot of ideas to promote abolitionist veganism. So Emilia, please come talk to us. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Woo! Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm just going to build a bit on, uh, on what my colleagues have said. And I'm going to focus on, on two things. The first thing is um, keeping it simple, and the second thing is identifying issues. What do I mean by that? Keep it simple, pretty obvious. Be prepared, know the types of things that you want to say, understand the philosophy, understand how it makes you feel and why you are vegan. And then when you convey that to somebody, keep it short. In the initial conversation, of course, you'll always go into detail after. But when you're t having these quick conversations, keep it simple. Keep it simple, go short, later, go long. And identifying issues, what do I mean by that? A lot of times we get these questions, we get these, um, people come up to us and say, well, you know, this and that and the other thing, and they, they create this great big problem that they, they, they sort of hand over to you. Pick it apart. Pick it apart. Remember to keep it simple. Keep, pick it apart. Step back 
and identify the issues. Focus first on veganism as a moral baseline, and then you can address the other issues. Let me, let me give you two quick examples. Um, one, of the, one of the examples I'll give you, uh, I wrote a piece about it on, on Ekaratsi, actually, somewhat recently. And it's when people conflate the issue of poverty and veganism. And they are, they're separate issues. Of course, they are interrelated and you can address them both. But address veganism first, and then let's talk about poverty and what, what that means and what we must do as vegan advocates in relation to both of those issues. The other, for example, is uh, when people say, oh, well, this is my journey and this is about me and so on and so forth. Again, step back, bring it back to veganism, bring it back, use the core of veganism, use the animals as your center, pinpoint your advocacy on that idea and always remember them first and then address everything else because ultimately that's what it's about. It's not about me, it's not about anybody else, it's about them and of course everything it emanates from there and it's sort of like a, like a wheel um, and keep that in mind and you will have very effective conversations and also people will feel a lot more um, less confused and less anxious because they will see the issues as separate and they'll be able to say okay I get it now I can do I can look at everything and I can see things clearly and I don't have to feel so overwhelmed because we know it is overwhelming sometimes in, in what we face in the world and what we think about and with all the issues that that we are faced with so those are those are my two big things and that's actually what I do whenever I try to talk to somebody or whenever I have a piece to write, I think about that. Identify the issues and I try to keep it simple. And um, one more personal quick note, if you see me leaving the stage, it's not personal, I have a flight to catch. <laughs> Thank you very much. I should have mentioned that um, Eat Like You Care is in 12 or 13 languages now and she translated the Italian, the whole thing. I mean, she translated the <laughs> Italian. Um, Christian Sanchez was somebody that I met sort of fairly recently in the grand scheme of things. Um, he came to my attention because he was working with um, Vanda Kadas doing advocacy in East Palo Alto and they were really focusing on, on socioeconomically challenged communities. And I thought that was terrific. I mean, I really think that's extremely important, as Anna was talking about yesterday. Um, you know, we've got to make this a movement for everybody. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of social justice implications, and we've got to respect and recognize them all. And, um, and Christian uh, gave a talk yesterday about what he's doing in East Palo Alto with Vanda. And um, I was so moved by it. Last night, we were sitting in Herbivore. Herbivore is the place we've been living in for the past three days because it's got lots of tables. And so you know, we get large groups to go down there and we, we hang out. Um, and and you know, we, all, we know the, the wait staff by name, by first names now, and we feel like family. But um, last night, I asked him to become a moderator on our page, and he's accepted. So he's our newest moderator on the Evolution Support Facebook page. And he's going to have to talk to you a little bit about advocacy. Hey, guys. I want to talk about um, using a, a powerful, peaceful arsenal in your, in your advocacy. I wanted to talk about uh, the power of moral intuition. And by moral intuition, I mean talking about the predicate of becoming a vegan. That's basically what we all agree on, is that um, animals, they all, they all have moral value. And basically the question to ask is, um, do you believe that it's wrong to unnecessarily inflict suffering and pain on, and death on animals? And that's the question to ask every time. It takes the focus away from anything else where the conversation may go to and brings it back to the fundamental, to the fundamental point. Um, I notice that like when you speak to, to a more uh, intellectual audience or to an in intellectual person, you get more, they have more justifications for their animal use. They, they pick different things from plant sentience to, uh, 
to humane options, to whether plants have souls and we all, everything has, has a meaning, but they get carried away. And, but, but what we have to do is we have to bring it back to the fundamentals. We have to bring it back to, uh, yeah, like I said, um, moral intuition, the, the predicate, which we all agree on. And that most people will say yes, because most people do care about animals. And from there you can, you can go on and, and bring it home. Um, it, you, you really want to stay away from discussing things that, that go away from the moral obligation that we have. You don't want to talk about, you don't, you don't really want to talk about health. Uh, it's a side effect of going vegan, as well as the environment. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just always ask that question, um, educate yourself. Uh, it'll be much smoother. You can always ask that question at, at any point in the conversation. It'll actually get you away from places you don't want to go when you're talking to people. They really will. Really things you don't have to discuss anyways. It, it's, it's really arbitrary. You want to get back to the fundamentals. Uh, do you care about animals? Uh, are you vegan yet? Um, do you believe that animals have any value? Do you believe that they're things or, or persons? go from there, really. That's about it. Thank you. Um, next up, Ben Frost is someone um, who appeared on my page several years ago and always wrote excellent comments. I um, mean, he was always interacting with people. And, um, and he was always making, he was always, everything he wrote was very, very solid and indicated uh, a pretty deep understanding of, uh, of the abolitionist position. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, last uh, October when I was in London for an event. And um, we, uh, we really uh, got to know each other. And, and uh, not only that, but he's really good with technical stuff. He's a terrific, and, and he's, you know, like, like everybody here, he's a friend. But uh, he's a wonderful guy. He makes tremendous contributions to the work that we're doing. Ben, ben oh, Ben Frost, there he is, Ben. He tables in, is it Man Manchester, right? Yeah, he, he tables in Manchester, tabling, good stuff. Hello. Hi. Um, my advocacy tip um, for today is something that's quite a controversial and sort of triggering topic for a lot of people um, and it's actually something that I'm going to suggest that we try and avoid in our advocacy and that's the question of whether it's appropriate to use violent imagery when we're advocating to non-vegans whether we should be um, using posters you know um, that show cows hanging upside down with their throat slit and blood pouring out and whether we should be um, holding the corpses of non-human animals, lifeless corpses, um, in street theatre, and all these sorts of stunts. And it, it's my position, um, that's, a, that's a bad idea. And um, I'd like to go through a couple of reasons as to why I think that is. And I think when we start thinking about these questions, it's important to remember the context in which we're, we're addressing them. And for the last couple of hundred years now, um, as, as Gary and Anna have so eloquently um, developed and talked about in their work the last 30 years, um, we are living in a society that is dominated by animal welfareism. And it is the default position of almost every non-vegan without even realizing it. And that's the position that animals matter, sure. Um, yeah, we shouldn't make them suffer, okay. Um, but, you know, the, you know it, it's okay to kill them as long as we do it humanely. And that's, that, that really has its, um, its foundations in um, the, the utilitarian thinking of the, the, sort of the late 19th century. And um, that, that, is, that is a position that is, that is pervasive in our society. And so when we tackle a question of something like, um, is it wrong to use violent imagery in our advocacy, we need to bear in mind that the, the non-vegan population that's where they are in their heads generally. They, 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 they buy into it without even realizing get the idea that um, animal use is fine so long as it's done humanely. And with that in mind, um, that's where a number of issues with violent imagery start occurring. 
Um, because when you, when, when, you, when you put up a poster depicting some sort of violence to, to, towards an animal, or when you engage in some sort of street theatre, there is no way that a non-vegan passerby can interpret that um, in a way other than uh, in a way other than what they sort of already believe with their conventional their own conventional wisdom. Um, they will look at it, and if there's no sort of follow-up, which there generally isn't, um, they will interpret it as perpetuating the idea that yes, this is horrific. What is being done to these animals? This is an this is absolutely abhorrent, and it shouldn't be done. And um, you know we should avoid causing all that sort of horrible, nasty pain. Um, but you know it's okay because you know I eat cage-free eggs, or you know it's okay because I'm eating crate-free pork. Um, you know when we present these images, we are not we are not fulfilling. We are not um, doing right essentially by the non-human animals that we. That we, that we wish to do right by, in the sense that we are not, we are not attacking, attacking is the wrong word, but we are not um, addressing the fundamental core beliefs of the non-vegans that we're engaging, because we are not asking them to challenge their own perception of animals as things to use as resources. Um, we are not challenging the notion that use is the actual problem, not treatment. In, 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 in a strange way, in relying on violent imagery, we are we are using the, the, the welfare as conventional wisdom and we are perpetuating it. In my view, that, that's the main problem with using violent imagery in that it creates this, this perpetuation of something that we need to try and get away from and it doesn't attack the, the fundamental core beliefs of the non-vegans that we are trying to educate. Um, building on that point, I would say that it is crucially important that we advocate um, with clarity and with consistency um, and something like violent imagery it remains horrifically open to interpretation um, what one person sees another person will see differently what one person thinks upon seeing such an image will think and see something else as I said um, you know you'll get people that you know on the off chance they might think oh damn um, you know I'm using animals maybe that's a bad thing but then, on the other hand, another person will walk past and think, "Huh, yeah, that's bad." But you know, you know, I'm doing my best. I'm, you know, I'm a reducitarian. You know, I'm a flexitarian. I'm, you know, that you know, it, it promotes, it, it, it propagates this this sense that people can sort of create their own, create more excuses for themselves because they don't have to address it because they don't feel like they have to. Um, so yeah. The, as, as sort of as an annex to that, another point that I'd like to make, and which um, you know, again, I, I realise is controversial for a lot of people, but I also find that um, using imagery in this way um, is actually quite disrespectful to the non-human victim that is involved in the image, um, in the sense that you know we would never, in a human context, go out on the street and hold you know the you know the lifeless remains of a human being as some sort of promotional stunt, um, you know, that wouldn't even occur to us as something that was rational or moral to do, yet when it comes to animals, um, we are, you know, uh, some people are more than happy to go out and, you know, take bodies from slaughterhouses and continue perpetuating the idea that animals are objects for us to use in some way, because essentially that's what it's still doing, it's, you, you're using them as some form of, of tool and I, I, I find that to be disrespectful to the victims of that exploitation um, and I think we need, to, we need to be mindful of that and again um, as, as Gary talks about in his work you know, we need to apply the principle of equal consideration um, in, all of our, in all of our sort of conflicts with animals and to me um, in doing these sorts of stunts we are not applying the principle of equal consideration because we are, we, we are using animals in a way that we would not use human remains, you know, we would treat the human remains with respect. Um, so that's, that, that's sort of, you know, I, I appreciate that a lot of people might not agree with that, um, but really the, the fundamental thing is that when we use violent imagery we are perpetuating the idea that treatment is the issue and not use, and that in my view is, is, the, is the wrong thing to do. We should be embracing the abolitionist approach, we should be 
um, focusing on the idea that treating animals as property is a violation of their fundamental right as sentient beings not to be used as resources. And when you, I mean, Gary mentioned that I, I do tabling efforts, um, that is an incredibly effective approach and, and Christian has, um, has, has touched on it as well and that's the idea of, um, of what Gary and I refer to as the humane treatment principle and the, that's the sort of the idea that you know, everyone agrees that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering and death on animals. And my point with that is that you, you don't even need to use any sort of stunt or graphic imagery to get people thinking about animal use. And when you use that argument, when, you know, when you're tabling, when you're doing your activism, when someone comes up to you, as soon as you use that argument, people are switched on immediately because they think, damn, yeah, I agree with that. You know, I don't think it's, I think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering and death. And then it's just a case of pointing out that if you agree that unnecessary suffering and death is wrong, the rational extension of that is veganism. Because if you are not vegan, you are inflicting that exact same unnecessary suffering and death that you claim to reject. And once people see that, I mean, I've tabled a number of times and not one person that I've come across has ever said that they disagree with that idea. Everyone agrees with it. Because as much as the welfare is position that is entrenched within society is incredibly problematic in that um, it focuses on treatment and it doesn't think that animal use is wrong, everyone still agrees that animals have moral value. And we need to use that. And that argument is an incredible way of tapping into that moral concern and using it to direct them to the abolitionist approach and the first principle, which is what I always directly link to, which is that we cannot justify using sentient beings as resources, as our property, and talking about why that is. And I would hope and I would suggest that every one of us um, would educate ourselves and um, read Professor Francione and Alan Charlton's books and um, get out there and do their own abolitionist tabling work or, or whatever it else it is that um, you feel comfortable to do. Thank you very much. You know, also, um, I agree with him, you should read all my books, but, um, but also on the website, um, abolitionistapproach.com, like there are hundreds of essays that you could like read, not now, don't read them now, but um, you know, you can read, you know, you can, so you can, uh, covering lots and lots of topics, including things like using graphic imagery and welfare versus rights and the property status of animals and stuff. So, you know, there's tons of stuff out there that we, we're pr providing, you know, for free that you can get access to immediately. Now we have Francis McCormick. Um, who is one half of the grumpy old vegans, um, and um, she's terrific. She's a medievalist. She, she teaches uh, medieval studies at the, uh, at the uh, National University of Ireland at Galway. And um, she is um, a real stalwart. She's been doing a lot. She's just started a new subsite, uh, or you know, howdoigovegan.com, where she's basically um, interacting with people just on the topics that we discuss in um, HowDoIGoVegan.com, which is a site that we um, that we launched last year, she does an awful lot. She moderates, um, she writes songs, um, and she does uh, she does an awful lot. She does she she helps with research work for projects that uh, that we're working on. Uh, and um, in any event, Francis, please. Aren't you all feeling lucky that you get to sit here and listen to these amazing advocates giving you some of their experience? Are you feeling inspired to get out on the streets tomorrow and start talking to people about veganism? Yeah? yeah. yeah. We're just, you know, we just had a fantastic weekend and, and we can go forward on this. This is what my talk is about. My talk is about asking questions. Um, I've asked you a couple of questions you're already, I can see, Agreeing with me, you're warming to me, you're going to be receptive to what I say. If you use questions in your advocacy, it makes you listen. You're listening rather than talking. But you can direct conversations in very clever ways to get people to say the things that you want them to say, that you would be saying yourselves, they're advocating to themselves. Let me tell you how this happens. Let me tell you how this works. So first of all, what you need to do is create rapport. You're only going to be able to advocate to somebody who likes you. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to be friends. It means you have to be pleasant. 
It means that you have to be approachable, you have to be open, you have to be trustworthy. Careful of body language, open body language, confident body language. Um, but listen and adapt. If you're listening, you can understand how your message that you're not actually delivering, you're asking your listener to deliver it. You can listen to how that's being received and you can steer the conversation accordingly. It's a far more intelligent and critical way of advocacy than just talking. Because our message, how we deliver it, depends on the person to whom we're speaking. I don't like the idea of elevator pitches. I will never give somebody the opportunity to ask me why I'm vegan. Because vegan is normal. Yeah. Animal exploitation is abnormal. Yeah. So instead of having them ask me why I'm vegan, I ask them why they're not. <laughs> and this is powerful. This is powerful. We need to change the conversation. Every single advocacy encounter you make is a form of political disruption. You're disrupting the status quo. You're getting people to think about how they use animals and why. And that's what we want to do. We want to start breaking that line of thinking down so that we can shift it and move it into new discussions, into new areas. So there are different kinds of questions that you can ask. You can, there's an excellent essay, and I can't remember the title of it because it's so long. Um, moral concern and I, I will post it on the How Do I Go Vegan site immediately after this talk. There's a, an excellent essay on moral concern, moral impulse and rational argument um, that Professor Francione has written and it talks about how, and if you've read Eat Like You Care, you know this trick. You get people to engage ethically and emotionally at the same time. So whatever stirs their concern about animals, uh, get them talking about their companion animals and listen, let them talk as long as they want to. Let them get emotional about the animals in their lives. You listen to them and you steer questions like, but tell me about your dog. How is your dog different from other dogs? You'll get things like he's interest, he's got interests. You'll get things like he's got an individual personality. These are the things that we would normally tell people in advocacy encounters. Now you've got people telling you. They're building their own framework. They're convincing themselves. All you've got to do is join the dots. So you can ask closed questions as well, and Christian pointed to this, to build that moral impulse. Do you think it's okay to inflict suffering on animals for when we don't have the need to do so? Chances are 99.9% .9 of the people you talk to will say, no, we shouldn't do that. So you're asking a question that gets a yes or no answer. Perfect. So you build on that and you can lead them to veganism. Another great question is if you talk about veganism, ask the person to whom you're speaking, does that make sense? If that makes sense to them, then why the heck aren't they vegan? So use these questions as a way of creating a cord between you, of creating um, areas of agreement, and you'll actually start to change their thinking. Um, you may not necessarily see the results. We often think of advocacy as something that has to be immediate, that if we haven't made a vegan there and then on the spot, we haven't been successful. One of my friends, um, she was talking to me about sheep. I, I didn't know her very well at the time. And I said to her, oh, you're vegan. And she said, no. Now, I didn't ask, are you vegan? It was, oh, you're vegan. You are vegan. Um, and she said, no. And I said, why not? And she shrugged and she walked away from me. And a lot of people shrug and walk away from me. I'm used to it. <laughs> but she came back to me the next week and she was vegan. She went away with that question in her head and she processed it and she thought about it. She went straight to the abolitionist approach site and she found the materials. I mean, abolitionist immediately. Why aren't you vegan? She started to think about it and, and, and realize it was the only thing that made sense. We can also use Socratic questions, so big open questions to try and clarify positions. So ask your listener, well, why do you think it's okay to buy humane animal products. Why do you think cage-free eggs are okay? What do you think is the difference between a cage-free egg and an egg that comes from uh, a battery hen? Is that a good enough reason to continue using animals if they give you an objection? What do you think the solution to this might be if they have a problem? And you're getting them to think, you're getting them to engage critically with it. Um, and the other thing that I like to do is to create doubt. So I will remind most of us, I'll ask you for a show of hands here, but most of us when we were children 
probably objected to eating animals at some point. When we realized that the steak or the chicken on our plate used to be a living being. Can I see a show of hands for those of you who went through that process? Okay, bring your listener back to that. When you were a child, did you, do, do you remember ever asking your parents or your guardian, you know, what, why are we eating? What were you thinking at the time? Bring them back to that and start them questioning it all over again. And the last thing that I do is um, the muddiest point strategy. Was there anything that we talked about today that wasn't clear? Anything you'd like to go over again? Um, and that can be a useful way of rounding up the discussion. And then, as um, I think it was Anita said, give them your card, give them your contact information. And I'm here, I'm here to help you. This is what I am going to do. I will contact you in a week, I'll contact you in a month and get people so that they've got questions. Ask them to have questions for you. Ask them to prepare those questions. Now they're leading the conversation. So we can, have, we can find ways of getting people to self-advocate if we listen, if we're patient, and if we really draw out that moral impulse. And that makes our job so much easier, but it also changes their mindset so they start to see our world as normal and theirs as abnormal. And that is what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, last year sometime, I became acquainted with Marlene Watson Terra. Um, she is one of the most knowledgeable nutritionists I've ever encountered in my life. I mean, um, her, her knowledge is encyclopedic. Um, she has a book. It'll, it's the best, next to my books, it's the best book you'll ever read. I mean, it's a terrific book. What's the next? What, what? Macrobiotics for all seasons. It's the best money you'll ever spend and it'll improve your health. I mean, she's just, it's just a terrific book. I really would recommend you get it and read it because um, she has an enormous amount of common sense. I knew very little about macrobiotics um, when I first encountered her. I'm learning more and more and uh, it's really terrific stuff. She's a terrific person. Her passion for educating and bringing all these issues together because a couple speakers down, we're gonna meet her significant other, um, Bill Terra, and they are really sort of on a mission. Uh, and I, I, Anna and I respect them very much because they're trying to do the same sort of thing, bring all of these issues together. And it's not just one issue, it's a, it's a number of issues and it's a way of looking at the world. So I'm very, very happy that Marlene Watson Terra is going to speak to you today. Greetings all once again. So as Gary said, you know, to have a healthy world, we need to have healthy people because when we have healthy people, we want the world to be one, to be united. We don't want to cause suffering and pain on any other being. So I do my advocacy work through, you probably guess what I'm going to say, learn to cook. People have this idea that they have a kitchen because it came with the house, you know? <laughs> People don't cook in my country anyway, they don't cook anymore. So when you take responsibility for your own health and you start to understand that when you're a healthy human, you want everything else, you, you have more love in your heart, you know, and the hundreds of thousands of families that have changed to veganism, not because they come to Bill and I because they want to know about veganism, we're long-term vegans, they come because they've got cancer, they've got heart disease, they've got diabetes, they've got every disease under the sun. When we change their diet, when we change the concept of don't eat animals, eat plants. If you're vibrant and you have a mission and a vision, that's what makes me jump out of bed in the morning, apart from my husband. But, you know, when you have a vibrancy about you and an energy that you want to change the world, it's infectious, right? It's contagious. People want to be with people that are excited about life, that are excited about doing, you know, what we're doing with our work. But we do it through education. And, you know, as Nelson Mandela said, it is the most powerful tool that we all have to change the world is education. So that's what we've been doing for the last three, four decades. When people come to me, the first thing I do is I like to teach them a little rhyme and I want you all to learn it today. So when you go home, you'll remember one thing about me and it was, after each line I want you to repeat and then we're going to say it all together. So, food makes the blood, 
Blood makes the cells. Cells make the tissue. Tissue makes the organs. And here we be. So we'll say it all together. So we eat plants, and this is who we are. We we eat dead animals, dead flesh, all that torture, all that suffering. That's what we become. So from the top, food makes the blood. Blood makes the cells. Cells makes the tissue. Tissue makes the organs, and here we be. Once again, louder. Food makes the blood. Blood makes the cells. Cells makes the tissue. Tissue makes the organs, and here we be. So we become these beautiful plants. That's who we are. We eat plants all day long. You know, we're herbivores. And people say to Bill, where did you find her? Do you wind her up in the morning and she just goes all day like an energizer bunny? Because that's where I get my energy from when I rise in the morning until I go to bed at night. And you know, it's not that I'm you know, um, any more educated than another nutritionist or another person, but nutritionists come to Bill and I and say, oh my God, you have opened so many windows of opportunity for me to educate people. They don't need animal food. They don't need supplements. They live just from the land like we do. We basically teach a third world designer diet. I mean, seriously, grain, beans, pulses, vegetables, sea vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, veganic gardening. You're going to hear later from the gorgeous Merlin Rees, and I interviewed Merlin for my series as well. Um, you know, people think they, well, I'm just going to go back to eating all the chemicalized stuff. I don't want to eat organic gardening because it's full of cow pats, you know. You can grow your own food without even using anything from another animal. We do it. So, one more time, learn to cook. Get back into your kitchen. It's not there because it came with the house. It's there because you take responsibility about what you feed your body every day. Why? Because food makes the blood. Blood makes the cells. Cells makes the tissue. Tissue makes the organs. And here we be. We're all these amazing plant-based people, vegan people. And we can change the world because we all have the same mission. We all have the same vision. We want the world to be vegan, right? Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, really, get the book, read the book, you'll love it. Uh, next up, uh, Alan O'Reilly. Uh, Alan is someone else uh, I've known for a couple of years. I uh, only met him for the first time in London last year. Um, he, if you are on my page at all, you probably have noticed um, a lot of his comments. He writes terrific comments. He's very, very knowledgeable about the theory of abolition. He works very hard and he's the other half of the grumpy old vegans and he is older than the younger of the grumpy old vegans. Okay, Alan. Um, and um, it's an issue surrounding uh, sites like Facebook. Uh, that I want to talk about this afternoon. Um, public perception of vegans varies between we're a bunch of tree-hugging hippies all the way up the scale to we're fanatical cult members. Okay. Now, we need to dispel uh, this image and show veganism in a good light. When we're on Facebook, very often people who are not participating in conversations but are nevertheless looking in on what is going on. Now we rather affectionately call these people the lurkers. <laughs> now what I want to do this afternoon is just talk to you a little bit about how you can uh, tailor your advocacy to take into account the people who are there not directly participating in the conversation but are nevertheless interested in what you have to say because I'm sure Many of us, if not all of us, have at some point been contacted by somebody who's seen something we've said somewhere else. On Facebook, for example, we've made a comment, and that's why they've contacted us. We didn't know they existed at the time. Now we do. Um, so, what do we need to do in order to uh, think about these people, the lurkers, when we're actually advocating? First of all, is I think we need to make people understand that we're just ordinary people. We are not 
tree, hu tree huggers, well some of us might be, but most people aren't tree huggers and neither are they fanatical cult members. So the first thing I think we ought to do when we're advocating on social media sites is to be polite and to be gracious. Sometimes in the face of some real difficulties, all right? But I can tell you that if there is a Facebook thread, for example, that's the equivalent of the Third World War, anybody looking in will see one side being nice and, one, and the other side being obnoxious, and they will take the side of the person who's being nice. Right? So it is really important to, to be pleasant when you're advocating. I'm not saying that you should, uh, that you should always be, uh, give in to, to people who are being nasty. You can be firm by all means, but you should always try and be civil. I think that's very important. We are information givers. We need to make sure that people who are looking in on these threads receive information which tells them why they should be vegan and how they can be vegan. What we don't want to do is to get involved in arguments with people that are counterproductive and move away from giving that information. You can make an argument, but you shouldn't get involved in an argument. Right? So you do really need to think of ways that you can keep control of the conversation. Always stick to the point, stick to the topic. Bring people back to the topic if they are trying to derail the conversation. You will meet a lot of people on social media sites such as Facebook um, who have uh, different agendas. Some of them genuinely want to ask questions, are interested, others are trolls, others have absolutely no intention of doing anything except trying to get you to go and eat a bacon sandwich. Right. But if you make sure that you keep control of that conversation, always give answers that include information that people can use if they see it. Right. Keep away from straw men arguments and other logical fallacies and ensure that you always stick to the point then anybody looking in on your conversation will be able to take something away from it. Because what we are doing is sowing seeds in soil that at that time we are unaware of. But it is always there. As I said before, people do come back to us and say, I saw you on blah, 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 blah. Right? Uh, can I have answers to this particular question? So when we're advocating on uh, sites like Facebook, we're not there to win. It's important that we, we, we treat it as an advocacy opportunity, not an opportunity to show how good we are. We are advocating for other people, we're advocating for the victims of injustice. We're not advocating because we want, to, we want ourselves to be seen as heroes. We want to make other vegans. Right? We're already vegan, we need an awful lot more. So that's the opportunity that we should be taking when we're doing this. So the final thing I want to say really on, these, uh, on this subject is, learn how to bow out of a conversation. Know when it is time to stop. Because otherwise it just goes on and is, is effectively counterproductive. Right? Arguments can become circular. Uh, you can actually get fed up with, um, with people trying to troll you. All right? It does get a bit wearing after a little while. All right? But even those types of conversation can be good for these third parties looking in because you have given a lot of information, a lot of links, things they can go away and look up for themselves and come back to you or to somebody else at a later date. Most of the people who go vegan uh, as a result of your advocacy, all right, you will not know about because they will go off on a different road, but you will have planted those seeds. You will have helped to make it happen. Nobody can make anyone vegan. They've got to do it for themselves as we all did, but you can help them in your advocacy Give them the information, let them go away and use it for themselves. Show vegans in a good light, we're ordinary people, anyone can be vegan, they should be vegan, it's up to us to show them how to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, last year at the summit, I met, uh, in addition to Peggy, 
Uh, I met Van Dekatis, uh, and we had a wonderful several days together. And she impressed me with her energy. I invited her to become a moderator. She fulfills a very important role. Things often get heated. I do not know why, but things often get heated on the page, and people get really animated, and discussions get sometimes intense. And Vonda's really, really great at, um, at, at uh, coming into a tense situation and making comments which diffuse tension. As a matter of fact, she's actually extremely good at it. And I'm always, I always marvel at how she sort of walks into the middle of what looks to be like a meltdown that's heading towards World War III. And she gets it back on track and she mm -hmm. diffuses the tension. And I appreciate that a great deal. Vonda. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I'm very grateful to be here, and thank you so much for coming. Secondly, <coughs> Professor Francino, I want to tell you that my vegan advocacy changed tremendously since I have learned the abolitionist approach, as I use as a framework of my vegan advocacy. Thank you so much. Today, I'm here to talk about what we do when children are approaching our tabling. We do tabling, what we call um, week, every week, um, Thursday tabling. You can do it any day, but we just call it Thursday tabling, vegan Thursday tabling, that is. And we have lots of children coming. So what is fun about children, that they are very open. They are there to learn. The way we make it even more interesting for them is, of course, making it fun. So today, I want to encourage all of you to engage in a little bit of role play. This is what we do, uh, mostly I do, but uh, Christian does it occasionally too. Engage them in a role play situation because they're always curious and they love the display, okay? A display, as you might have seen on the slides uh, the other day, we have lots of fresh fruits, uh, we have wonderful pictures of animals, nothing gory, all lovely, all nice. So what happens, uh, children come there, they, they just, they just want to get engaged, they have no idea what veganism is, most of the time, they have no idea what's going to happen, but they come. Okay, so you pretend that you are going to be the children who come to my table, all right? Are you ready for this? Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm going to ask questions and you can just randomly answer. You don't have to, you know, just yell in, okay? Normally, they just do exactly like that. They just yell in. Unless somebody gets really stuck to my side and then they stay there for like half an hour, they stop yelling because they are too busy observing. <laughs> All right, so do you see this watermelon? I didn't bring one yeah. today. Yeah. Have you eaten one before? Yeah, yes. no, never. Okay, so, well, this is a good time for you to try. Yeah. All right, so I got a knife here and I am going to cut into this watermelon. What is going to happen? Can anyone tell me what might happen? It's going to crack open. It's true, it's going to open. But is the watermelon going to do anything? No. No? Are you sure? Yes. How do you know? Because we ate. It can't. And why can't the watermelon do anything? Why? can talk, that's true. And what else the watermelon cannot do? Can't run away. Can't run away and how come? Why? Doesn't it have? Doesn't have legs. It doesn't have legs, that is true. Okay, so watch me cutting the watermelon. What is happening? So, yeah, it's just opening up. Look how red it is. It's awesome. All right. So what are we going to do now? The watermelon is here, it didn't yell, it didn't run away, it didn't cry. What can we do with the watermelon? Eat it! Yeah, do you like eating it? Yes! Me too. Okay, so we are handing out some watermelons, everybody's jumping. Okay, so they are busy doing something, what they like doing, what they wanted to do, they are eating, okay? 
And instead of talking about the watermelon, this is when you shift the conversation and bring it back to veganism, okay? So did you notice that the watermelon, they are busy jumping, okay? So they don't, you know, they are kind of captive audience, all right? So did you notice that the watermelon did not run away, did not cry out in pain, did not yell? Did you notice that? And everybody's like, yeah, like, what is she talking about? Of course not. All right. So, <laughs> so they just keep eating and, you know, my little captive audience is listening. And it's like, but what happens? And then I point to my table, for example, to the cute piggy family. I point, what happens if I were to be a mean person and get a knife and cut into that piggy? What will happen then? And everybody looks at me like, is she okay? Like, who would want to do that, right? They really do. They do look at you like that. And uh, somebody usually says, what? What will happen to the piggy? He'll cry, he'll run away, he'll be hurt. That's right, the piggy will cry. Why? How come the piggy cries and the watermelon doesn't? Because it hurts. It hurts. Are you saying that the pig has feelings? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the watermelon doesn't have feelings? Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's when you go right into that. So, okay, the reason we are vegan, because we eat plants since they don't have feelings. We use plants for, and then I point out my bed, they love my bed usually, of course, and this and that. I point out all kinds of things that we vegans use. And we do it such a way that they understand that that's what vegans do. And that's what vegans don't do, such as using a knife and cutting into a piggy. Everybody's jumping away nicely, very happy about it. And uh, what did happen in the last few weeks, uh, there was one family who went vegan. The children actually veganized the adults, which can happen. And we were very grateful about that. Uh, Christian showed the family, I'm sure some of you have seen the slide. Uh, they keep coming back, they have questions. It's very, very exciting for us. And there is, you know, always, always more children who are coming because they see the display, they want to know what is up. Okay, the main message here I'm trying to say today is that believe in what you're saying. First of all, as uh, my colleagues were mentioning, know your theory. Know exactly what you need to say. But Say it in such a way that they actually are involved in a learning process. You don't preach at them, you know, they get bored, they go away, you know, they take their water and they can walk away and like, that's not good. You want them to stick around, all right? For that, you have to make it a little bit fun and this is why I like creative, nonviolent vegan education, you know, you can play with that thought, you can play with that notion. You don't have to do things one way, you do it your way. I do it my way, I have this wicked accent, they always ask like, okay, where are you from and all that. Good icebreaker. If you don't have an accent, use something else. Put an, <laughs> put, put an interesting clothes on you, like put a funny hat. Do something which, you know, children will engage with, you know. And most of all, believe in what you say. I've been a long-term vegan and I really believe we can and we must achieve a vegan world. We are going to do this. This is a time to do this. Enough of the mumbo jumbo of vegetarianism, meatless Monday, all that nonsense, gotta go. This is time for us to get serious about vegan education, creative, non-violent vegan education, and this is what we do. Thank you. When I first talked to, when I was Skyping last few months ago with um, Marlene Lanzantera, she was telling me about the virtues of a really sound macrobiotic approach and she said, you've never met my partner Bill, he's 75 and you know, you would never know that. And I thought, you know, she was just making a statement not to be taken seriously. Then I met Bill Terra. I still do not believe he is 75. 
Um, and I don't even refer to him as Bill anymore. I refer to him as the walking advertisement for Marlene's book. But, um, but in any event, uh, it's been a pleasure meeting Bill. He, he, he is an expert in Chinese medicine. He's also a macrobiotic nutritional expert, but he has a really deep background in Chinese medicine. And he's, if, if you saw his excellent presentation this morning about human ecology, he's an ethicist as well. An, an absolutely fascinating and wonderful guy. They're a terrific couple. Bill, please come up and say a few words. Well, I can't really say much about the advocacy other over and above what's already been said from here. I mean, you've got so much information. So I want to talk about something just a little bit different. Uh, first of all, our advocacy is done through smoke and mirrors. People don't think that they're going to get involved with anything vegan when they come to Marlene and I. It's just like a, it's a it's a honey pot. <laughs> so they come to us because they want to get better, they want to improve their health, or they want to study about health. And uh, we don't put anything out there that they have to eat in a particular way, or be a certain way, or have any particular ethical stand. And health, so. And that is that when you're talking to people, um, when they hear the word vegan, they're going to make an automatic health association, whether you want them to or whether you don't want them to. You want, them to t you want to talk to them about the ethics of the issue, that's fantastic, but there's always something that's going to go on in there that has to do with health, and that's because they have been told their whole life with incredible and impressive brainwashing, right? that they absolutely need animal foods in order to survive, in order to be healthy. Right? And so I wanted to make a couple of comments on that. And the, the first thing that I want to say is I want to channel Bobby McFerrin here and say, don't worry, be happy. Right? You know? Because there is, even among vegan people, I have noticed that there is a lot of insecurity around nutrition. And what I want to say to you is that Nutrition has been made extraordinarily complicated, and it's not. It's not complicated at all. It's very, very simple. And not only is it very simple, but 95% of all the nutritional research that's been done out there, it comes out with exactly the same conclusion. We should be eating a plant-based diet. When people talk about, oh, well, this study or that study, nonsense. When you review the studies, when you do the meta-studies, this is the way that everybody should be eating, regardless of why they do it. People should not be using animals as a source of nutrition, period, exclamation point. And so you'll find that people want to argue with you, don't you? Yes. Have you, have you experienced that? Oh, yes. Oh, because if you haven't experienced it, you probably haven't been talking about it, right? Because, <laughs> because there's a lot of argument that happens around that. And some of that argument is well-meaning. If people think, if they've, been, if they've been told that if they don't eat uh, meat that they're, not, they're gonna have a protein deficiency or even a vitamin B12 deficiency or any other kind of deficiency, if they don't drink, uh, cows, if they don't drink cow's milk, their bones are gonna crumble. No, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing that's behind there. And sometimes there is a sincere concern about the fact that you might be doing something that's dangerous. So I just want to put that out there. And that's usually from people who are your family. Right? So family oftentimes think that. Right? And the only way that you can counter that is by demonstrating your own health. That's the only way you can, that you can counter it. You can tell them as many things as you want to tell them, but nothing's going to make a difference aside from you being healthy and vibrant. And when I say that, I mean, it doesn't mean that everybody has to do, you know, every once in a while on Facebook, somebody was talking about Facebook, you see pictures of 80-year-old uh, grandmas with a six-pack, you know, kind of that kind of, that kind of thing, vegan bodybuilders, you know, <laughs> and all of that. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you are normal in that you have energy about you and you can engage people and you can do things in life. You're not dragging your feet around all the time. So that's the most, that's the most important advocacy that you can have. 
You know, I, I was mentioning that in my, in my talk this morning, but that's one of the things that can really put people off, is when they see people that are just depleted, right? And so, nutrition is simple. I'll give you a little example. In the 1800s, there was a uh, empress in Japan, and she made it illegal to eat meat or use dairy food for the whole nation. 1800s, right? For a year, nobody in the whole country, anything, this is an edict from the emperor. You don't screw around with that. It was punishable, right? You know, and, the, and, and the emperor then took rice and gave it to the fishermen around the ocean because the Japanese people have relied uh, traditionally on a lot of fish in their diet. So she, she subsidized the fishermen so that they could live and the whole country went vegan. The interesting thing is that they didn't all die. Right? You know, the, 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 the nation not only survived, but they were exceptionally healthy after that. And that happened several times in Japanese history, right? where there were edicts, where no animal food was used at all. The, the reason, of course, being the, the Buddhist uh, attitude about not creating suffering, right? which sometimes got lost along the way. Right? But that's, a, that's, a, that's traditionally in Buddhism. You don't do damage. You don't create suffering with any creature. Right? And so the point that I'm making here is that if you're eating a, a sustainable, good, vegan diet, you are going to be healthy. And if you're not healthy, right, it's really simple. All you need to do is just start tweaking what you're doing. Right? And when I say that it's a healthy diet, I want to make a cautionary note here. And I don't want to offend anybody. But a lot of times what people are doing with a vegan diet is following dietary precepts that are very, very new and very specific in terms of the kind of people that have been using them. For instance, uh, we live in a cold climate, and, and, and a lot of times when you see things from uh, written about health and eating a vegan diet, they're written by people who live in South Florida or, or Southern California. You know, so they're drinking juices and they're, you know, eating mangoes and, hey, cool dude, and, you know, and that, that kind of approach, right? But that's okay if you're living in that kind of climate, but if you're not living in that kind of climate, if you're living in a cold, if you're living in Wisconsin, or someplace like that, or Glasgow, Scotland, you're going to have a snotty nose all the time, you know, because that's not suited. So we have to start thinking environmentally, and we have to start thinking sustainably. Sustainable food on planet Earth for human beings is grains, beans, and vegetables. Grains, beans, and vegetables. Marlene said it's a third world designer diet. That's the kind of diet that we need to be having. And that would feed everybody. And that would be one of the most wonderful things that could happen. There would be no violence involved and everybody would get to eat. I, I just think of that. Everybody would get to eat. Right now, there's almost equal numbers of people who are starving and people who are obese. Think about that for a minute. It's like, that's kind of a weird balance, right? You know, obese people, chronically obese, and starving. And so, don't worry about it. Nutrition is simple. Don't get panicked about, am I going to have this nutrient or that nutrient? Just eat really good food, sustainable food, regional food, seasonal food, and you will be fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next up, Damon McDonald. Uh, is a moderator on the page. He's a terrific contributor. He's very knowledgeable about health issues. He has a really good understanding of abolitionist theory. He does, he's very, very good at tabling. He's got a lot, you know, he, he's very creative when it comes to that particular form of advocacy. And last night, um, he and I started conspiring, and he's also knowledgeable about filmmaking, and we're going to make a documentary about abolition, abolitionist veganism. <laughs> So I'm invested in this guy. Be nice to him. Damon, right. Hello. Um, sorry, bear with me for a second. I've just got a few photos that are going to go with um, 
what I'm speaking about today. So I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to speak uh, briefly and generally about how to get set up with tabling. Okay. So firstly, I think if you, if you want to start tabling, identifying a location first is a good idea. Um, ascertain where you want to table. Um, will it be on the street or at a particular event, local markets or in a park, etc. I highly recommend putting yourself in a high traffic flow area, basically somewhere where there are a lot of people is ideal. Once you identify where you're going to table, that'll dictate the type of setup and other costs or requirements uh, may rule out a particular location. If it's just on the street, um, you can start with a very small table and uh, minimal setup. Uh, check with your local council or whatever relevant authority as to what is or isn't allowed there. If it's a market stall or event, there may be a particular criteria uh, to be met as required by the uh, event or market organiser, um, but no matter where you go, the cost of the setup will uh, vary. And, and but most options you can still work with on little or no budget, um, depending on how resourceful you are and how much time you have. Um, obvi obviously, I believe that an impact sign is important, and it must be clear that you're there to talk about veganism. If you want people to approach you to have engaged conversations about veganism, then I believe you must use the word vegan in your main sign. Um, it can be handwritten or printed, um, and uh, impact doesn't mean it has to be big. Um, starting off with a small table on the street uh, will mean a relatively small sign, but you can make it stand out. Um, fantastic example. New Zealand Vegan on Facebook, um, it, that's a great example starting off with a very minimalist setup when she first began, um, like that is a small table but she's, she's made a huge impact there um, and she has pictures of when she started out and uh, evolving the setup over time as she goes. As far as materials are concerned, I don't believe um, you need a lot to start off with. Uh, or even now I only use three or four handouts, some printouts and pictures on the table to give people something to look at. Um, the handouts are great for people to take away, um, but most importantly they have to be the right handouts that will send people to the right places for um, information, such as the website howdoigovegan.com. Um, the resources and posters that I use are actually on that site to print out as well. Um, and I get leaflets uh, supplied by the IVA, International Vegan Association, and also print off the Abolitionist Approach leaflet available on the Abolitionist Approach page, available on HowDoIGoVegan.com. Um, I find that the really important thing with tabling though is not the materials, but it's the conversations. The materials may help spark conversations, and the signage may bring people in, but it's what we say and how we interact with uh, how we interact, which determines the effectiveness of our advocacy in educating people. Um, so, in, in summary, I'd say scout a location. Um, if you're in a regular spot, people will come back to you to continue the conversation, and that's I think it's really critical. Uh, Vander and Christian do that, and they know how, how well that works. Gather your materials together, your signs, or make them. Borrow, hire, or buy an appropriate table if you don't have one. Um, if, if you want help or advice, don't hesitate to contact someone already doing it. We're always more than happy to help. I'm on Facebook, I'm available to help. Um, New Zealand Vegan, I'm sure she wouldn't hesitate to help people. Um, so get all set up, but the main aspect of your setup will be and should be educating yourself first. Um, at least make sure you've read uh, Eat Like You Care and the new Abolitionist Approach book. Um, use the other resources available to really understand what veganism as a moral imperative actually means and how we must convey this to people. I always focus on bringing the conversations I have back to the moral message. Um, for, for people starting out, I can say you will also learn as you go. The more conversations you have, the better you will get. I was very nervous starting out, 
um, but, it, but it's that first great engaged conversation you have that makes you realise that people do want to know, they want to learn and listen. And, and as all, has already been mentioned here, and we all know, we all do advocacy, we all do abolitionist advocacy, it's also very important that we listen to them. We let them speak, we ask them questions, and we really engage them. Um, but also try and keep them focused on their own individual moral responsibility to non-humans. Um, test your conversational advocacy skills on those around you. Friends, family, people on the bus or the train, at the shops, anywhere, with anyone. I mean, I think you should be trying to educate these people every chance you get, um, any way you can, um, but, but, but look at it as an opportunity to be able to practice and improve your advocacy skills. Um, if, if you haven't heard um, Professor Francione's commentary number 19, um, which is about five principles for talking to non-vegans about veganism. Um, it's, it's on the howdoigovegan.com uh, website, YouTube there as well. Um, I, I think it's an absolute must listen for anyone who wants to do tabling or, or any vegan at all really. And, and it, it's also in the new Abolitionist Approach book as well. Um, and all of, the, all of those commentaries by Professor Francione are great and well worth, absolutely well worth listening to. Um, in closing, I'd say please, if you can start advocating in any way, advocate from an abolitionist educational perspective. It works and you, and you can start now. Um, I, I think the non-humans that we're doing this for need us to stand up and do everything that we can to help and educate people to go vegan and truly shift the paradigm. Only a clear, consistent and uncompromising message of justice will do this. Thank you. I don't know, a few years ago um, when I had about 30,000 people on the Facebook page and I was doing it myself with um, with a uh, with one person basically helping me, and um, and it wasn't Anna. We're trying to get her to get a Facebook account. She still doesn't have one. Um, and and um, and so uh, I had one person, and that that person uh, stopped helping. And I was contemplating closing the page down. I mean, I you know couldn't do it myself. Um, and somebody I'd met didn't know very well. Somebody I'd met. Um, who lived in Mexico, a woman named Marianne Gonzalez, stepped forward and said, I'll do it. Wow. And she did. She stepped into the role. She built the page up. We've now, we're now looking at 80,000. And she's done an excellent job um, co-administering the page. She, she uh, translated uh, Eat Like You Care into Spanish. You know, this is a really serious issue. We've got, you know, we've got a lot of people uh, all over the place who speak Spanish, you know, and we don't really have a lot of resources for them. And I really felt strongly about wanting to get Eat Like You Care translated. Translating a book um, ain't an easy task. I mean, uh, especially, you know, especially a book with like, a lot of philosophical concepts that you have to really, you know, you gotta, it's not just a question of going word for word. You have to be very, very careful with what you did. And she did an absolutely fabulous translation. I think she's done a real service for spreading the abolitionist speaking uh, uh, word in the uh, Spanish speaking community. She's got lots of talents and she's gonna tell you about some of them right now and something else that we've just launched on the page, which I'm really excited about. Marianne. <laughs> many ways in which we can communicate abolitionist ideas is through drawing and other art forms. Now, as Foucault mentioned yesterday, if you have an interest in art and you would like to express yourself creatively, then you should do it, and you can do it. Anyone can learn how to draw, and anyone can, can make art with practice, and you can channel that towards advocacy. Now, one, um, these are some examples of comics I've done. <laughs> These are some examples of comics I've done to give you an idea of what I mean. And um, as you can see, <laughs> this is, um, I'll let you read it, right? Um,
So you hear, you see that, that there is no difference. It's trying to communicate there is no difference between a cat and a nun, any other non-human used for food and other purposes. This is another example. see a lot of imagery out there and I don't see necessarily any promoting a clear abolitionist message that is against welfare reform. So I'm trying to use um, drawing and imagery that specifically addresses the problems with welfare reform or at least uh, points it out as a problematic, a very problematic issue. So we normally, we post these on uh, Professor Francione's Facebook page, and we always link to essays for whoever's looking at this to go deeper and read the essays. This is also um, addressing the problem of humane treatment. Now, as um, my colleagues have mentioned, it is very important that you educate yourself on abolitionist theory to be able to communicate these ideas clearly. But uh, when it comes to advocacy, it's also important that you enjoy what you're doing. And in order to enjoy what you're doing, um, it's good to optimize and make use of your personal talents. So, so give it some thought, right? Identify creative ways to, to communicate these ideas. Um, for the benefit of animals. Thank you. You know, yesterday Sue Coe said, you know, anybody can learn how to draw. And then Mariana just said the same thing. Well, I have to tell you, I, I, I have a hard time with stick figures. So Marianne said, oh, no, no, you can learn how to draw. And she recommended I get this book, you know, drawing from the opposite side of your brain or whatever it was. And so I got the book. I still can't do anything but other, other than stick figures. As a matter of fact, it's actually gotten worse. Um, That's okay. You can do other next, things. Next to, what? That's okay. You can do other things. Eh. All right. <laughs> next up, the, the person I have known on the stage, I think, longer than anybody except for Anna, uh, is Jeff Purse. Um, I first met Jeff, God, it must have been 20, 20 years ago, probably. And I had just written a book called um, Rain Without Thunder, The Ideology of the Animal Rights Movement, in which I was, I, it was, it was when I was really beginning to see that the, the welfareist position was completely uh, problematic, and I wrote a book explaining why. And um, I heard there was this uh, young graduate student in Canada who, who wanted to discuss the book and had certain issues with it, and I, I thought that that meant that he had disagreements with it, and I just wasn't tolerable. And so, um, so I said, let me meet this guy. Let me find out what his problems are. And it turned out we've now been great friends for 20 years. And you know, one of the things I really like about him is that animal rights is not just an abstract matter. It never can. If it ever becomes an abstract matter, you've lost sight of it. You always got to remember the individual animal. You know, every night, we post on my page the New York City kill list, you know, of all the animals that are going to be killed the next day. And we always say, adopt a, an animal of any species. And I'm telling you something, that's an important part of animal rights activism. Domesticated animals are here because we put them in the mess. We have an obligation to do something about that. So we should all adopt, you know, animals, as many animals as we can of any species. You know, um, if you've got the resources to do it, give a home to a homeless animal because you know you can say, well, what the hell? What am I doing? You know, if I only give a if I give a, a, a home to one animal, there's still trillions of other animals that are going to be killed. And the answer is, for that one animal you save, you change the entire universe. Now, I am totally opposed to domestication. If there were two dogs left on the planet and it were up to me whether they continued to breed so that we could have pets, the answer would be not on your life. I think that domestication is a violation of animal rights. We ought not to be having any domestic animals in the world. We ought to stop, we have to stop bringing these animals to the However, however, we've got them here now and, and we've got, 
we have an obligation to do something about that. And one of the things that I really, you know, that just tells me who Jeff is, last night we're all walking home. It was, um, it was uh, uh, Anna and I were walking, and Mariana was with us, and Damon, and Jeff, and his partner, Gabrielle. And we saw this really sick rat run in front of us by people, into people's, you know, running across from the street into people's park. And um, it was, the rat was really ill. And um, we tried. Uh, it was really interesting that, that um, you know, Gabrielle had taken a, a wildlife course. And, um, and it was great, you know, Jeff, Jeff took off his shoes and gave her his socks and she put them on her hands and, and, and Damon went and got a towel and, and I called a vet and they said, you know, you can bring the rat in and, and we tried. Um, and and uh, we couldn't get the rat, the rat went into a, a, a burrow or whatever you know, in, the, in, the, in the bush. And, um, and this morning when I got, we, then we all went back to the dorms. We're all staying in the dorms. And so we went back to the dorms and this morning I found out that, that uh, Gabrielle and Jeff and Damon had gone back, I think, what, a couple of times, right? To try to find the rat and couldn't find the rat. But you know what, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, this is not an abstract thing. You know, animal rights is the rat. Um, you know, animal rights is helping individual animals. Jeff Purse has got an enormous amount of integrity um, I know him, I love him. Jeff. Hello everyone. As we have heard from Gary Francione and others at this summit, legal campaigns, even when successful, do not benefit non-human animals. All single issue campaigns are counterproductive. The only actions that will bring about the abolition of animal use are first going vegan yourself and then helping as many other people as possible go vegan. The abolition of all animal exploitation will only come about when we have a vegan world. What practical actions can we do now which will create as many new committed ethical vegans as possible in the shortest span of time? There are many answers to this question. Each person on this panel has provided a very helpful answer, and I am sure at least one of our answers will resonate with you. Find a method of vegan activism that works for you and make sure it is consistent with the six principles of the abolitionist approach to animal rights as developed by Gary Francione. Then get out there and do it. It is the only thing that will improve the situation for non-human animals. In the past, I have had one-on-one -on -one conversations with people persuading them to go vegan by providing reasons and answering their concerns. At the moment, my partner Gabrielle and I are reading Gene Sharp's classic three-volume book, The Politics of Nonviolent Action. It is full of so many practical strategies that have successfully been used in human rights struggles. I am hopeful that Gene Sharp's book will inspire me to think of powerful strategies and actions for creating new vegans. Again, the book is Gene Sharp's The Politics of Nonviolent Action, and it comes in three volumes. The practical grassroots strategy for vegan education that I am presenting to you today is something I've been interested in for, for a long time. I would like to have an all-in-one podcast, vodcast, and FM radio show. The focus will be on human rights with progressive politics, and it will include a segment on abolitionist veganism. The idea is to avoid having an explicitly vegan show for the purpose of attracting as many non-vegans in the audience as possible. If the show had four segments, there would always be one segment that clearly and powerfully argues for ethical veganism from the abolitionist approach. The placement of that vegan segment would always vary from show to show to keep the audience guessing. Hopefully, the human rights theme of the show as a whole would draw in progressively minded non-vegans who are receptive to the abolitionist vegan message. There are many podcasts, podcasts, and YouTube channels that attract millions of listeners and viewers. Some of them are about video games and other mindless pursuits, and some of them are about serious progressive politics. They have very large global audiences. The kind of broadcast that I'm talking about would start out very small and hopefully attract a larger audience over time. Local community radio stations are often happy for people to get broadcasting training and start new shows. Those same FM radio shows can then double as podcasts or broadcasts. Even though I am shy, and even though I am far from the greatest vegan educator out there, I have had success helping people go vegan. If I can do it, anyone can do it. 
My personality would be suited to an indie news style broadcast. Three or four segments of my show will be independent progressive news and one segment will be an editorial persuading people to go vegan. As the show develops, I could have interviews or even a live advocacy discussion between a non-vegan and a vegan educator. That's what I have in mind for my show, but if you did your own broadcast, you could make it into anything you want it to be, anything you're passionate about. As long as you are vegan, as long as you educate yourself first on the abolitionist approach, and as long as the ultimate purpose of your show is to make new vegans. Read Gary Francione's books, join an abolitionist reading group online conducted by the International Vegan Association. After you have a better understanding of what the abolitionist approach to animal rights actually is, you will then be ready to start doing your own grassroots activism. It could be a podcast or it could be any of the good ideas my fellow panelists are talking about today. Further inform yourself about the abolitionist approach and then go out there and become a vegan educator. Help us build a vegan world. Thank you. And now um, I'd like to introduce Anna Charlton. Other people call her the happiest, luckiest woman in the universe. <laughs> Uh, we've been together 40 years. We did it together. We became vegan together. We work together. We teach together. We write together. I couldn't have done it without her. Anna. All right. As she throws away any notes, because all these good people have said so many important things, I don't need to repeat them. But as Gary just mentioned, the span of time that we've been doing this, um, we do it very differently and so everyone who's going home I hope energized and inspired and thinking I'm gonna go out there and do this stuff I sit in a lot of audiences as you know going to conferences and I hear people say uh, to this, about the speakers on the stage that's really good but I could never do that and I either think or I say if it's with an earshot yes you can yes you could no 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 and then we've got this panel of wonderful people doing all this great stuff and I'm hoping that you're hearing something that would appeal to you but perhaps you're also thinking I couldn't do that they're doing that but I couldn't do that. that's all very well for them yes you can and yes you must this is a social justice movement and we're all here representing people who can't do it for themselves I don't just do animal work, I do human rights work. And there are so many vulnerable humans who need a voice to advance their interests. And that's only amplified when we're thinking about the animal situation. They need us. And one thing I remind myself of, because I'm not a natural at this, I talk for a living because I'm a lawyer and I'm a teacher. But there's the luxury of being in a role in that. You put your suit on and you go to court and you play lawyer. I walk in front of an amphitheater of teachers and I'm the professor and it's some of the personality has gone in that. You've got a natural authority because of the role you're playing. But sometimes one on one, talking about things that go right to our heart, that bring all our emotions to the surface, it can be difficult. And I'm not going to take a poll, but I bet you anything, some of the speakers here on the stage today, they had their toes curled up in their shoes when they were talking. And they might have been more nervous than they projected. I always am. But I will leave you with a couple of things that help me get up in the morning and do, do things. And they are two good quotes from an excellent poet called Audre Lorde. And some of you may be uh, familiar with her. She was a black feminist poet. And um, she said, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we're silent, we're still afraid. So it's better to speak. <laughs> the more important one that gave me the proverbial kick in the pants, which I mentioned on Friday and which I need, and I'm sure you will need because you're all going to go out from here, aren't you? Yeah. To do excellent vegan advocacy in your own voice, in your own communities, because that's the, the way we meet and have influence and inspiration about all the world of pre-vegans 
that are out there for us to talk to. Listen to this. It helps me, perhaps it will help you. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. It's not do it afraid, it's do it because it doesn't matter if you're nervous. First of all, people find it very refreshing to hear about a vegan message from someone who isn't shouting at them. They may have seen a demonstration, they may have come up against someone who's telling them what they're doing wrong in an accusatory manner. Most people are really ready to hear this message. One of the reasons we wrote Eat Like You Care, and heaven knows we wouldn't have anticipated how useful that has become. I am so grateful for that. People come and tell me that was something good to do. That was a good voice. Because it really focused on the fact that people already have the, the ethical framework in their heads. They're just ready. They're just ready to have that ignited in them. And you can all do it. You can all do it. You go practice. People are usually grateful, enthusiastic, and engaged. And yes, there will, people, will be people who come and talk to you about bacon. But just let it roll off you. Roll it off. Families are hard. Those people are hard. But there are so many wonderful people to engage in. So I'm going home inspired, I'm going home educated, I'm going to look forward to hearing at the next World Vegan Summit, Bob, about the new group of activists and what they've done, okay? Eva Lamper, who is the administrator of Ekorazzi, which is an important new site that speaks to a lot of young people. You know, you gotta, you gotta, we gotta be talking to young people and we've gotta be figuring out what languages they're using and what, what sorts of things are relevant to them. Would you like to come up and say something about Akarazi? Come up and say something about it. Hello, I'm Eva. Uh, really just a little bit honored and, and shaken by the mention. Um, I've had an incredible time this weekend, and the introduction is correct. I do work for ecorazzi.com. Uh, you'll see some of our posts on Gary's page because so many of these incredible moderators have built our site into what it has become in the last few months. It was um, primarily a welfareist page where we celebrated um, celebrities who ate vegan for 21 days and um, <laughs> thankfully uh, the work of a Hellenic Vincent de Paul in Toronto taking it over a hostile takeover now we are called the the unapologetic vegan perspective um, that is with an abolitionist lean and uh, honestly I'm very new to activism myself um, I've really enjoyed writing and sharing my views and finding people with similar ideas and perspectives to share. Um, we're honestly always looking for new people to write. Um, I feel like coming up here it would be a, a disservice to our site if I didn't invite everyone here who connects with this abolitionist approach and with the steps and feels um, they have more to learn or more to share to come to our site to read, to get familiar, to learn more um, about these wonderful people behind me, maybe a little bit more about myself, um, and then again to use to use our site and our uh, visibility as a platform to help your own activism and your own um, efforts to just get out there. So thank you. I met Suko in an art gallery on 57th Street in Manhattan 30 years ago. 
Um, and she has been a, um, a comrade ever since. She's a wonderful person. If you saw her presentation yesterday, you'll never forget it. So do you want to come up and say something? Sue Ko is the foremost political artist of our generation. She does, you know, she does tons of animal stuff, but she also does stuff on AIDS. She did stuff on South Africa. She has, there's not a social justice issue that has come up in my generation that she hasn't done, and war, we have a lot of that. Um, and that she hasn't done something about. You want to say something, Sue? Come on up. Come on up and say something. <laughs> if there are any more of her prints out there, if there are any left, get them. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to see all your beautiful faces. This, is, this conference has given me another year of energy to keep going. And in terms of activism, um, what I do is I, dr I don't use a camera, I draw. And I ask people their stories. And people are very rarely asked any questions, especially the working poor. So when you ask them an opinion, because I was never asked a question either, and then they'll really start communicating and I draw and then you slow time down by drawing because you don't have a digital device. And uh, I just came from um, the most beautiful place around here. It's a nursing home, care home for um, the elderly seniors. And uh, it would be a beautiful place to draw. It's Roman Catholic. And uh, we met a man who was very close with Father Barrigan, and he was in his 90s. Was he Father Joseph? Father Louis. And he was so beautiful, um, very tall, and he had two hearing aids. So I could have just stayed there all day listening to his Father Barrigan stories and how he's an activist. And we were saying, well, what about Clinton? <laughs> And he said, she needs help. She needs our help. And it had such good energy that's not about despair. It's a positive energy. And uh, then we met um, this a wonderful woman who's in her 80s, who's very, very smart. So I'd love to go in there and draw. And that's how I draw in slaughterhouses. I just assume people are very intelligent. And they have a lot to share especially about animals and that's where I've really learned from slaughterhouse workers um, you know in, in Sharia law countries it's the Dalek tribe that handle animals that slaughter animals and I know it sounds odd to you but they have great compassion um, they see themselves as abused in the same way the animals are and they have many many injuries um, so it's really telling people's stories and asking them questions and drawing or you could write a poem or make a song it's about slowing down the time and giving people the time to give you every one of us has the answers and so when you ask people, what should we do about this, they, have, they think and then they'll, they can hear themselves speak. And it gives you such a positive affirmation that we can make a non-violent world. When you just listen to regular people, not in universities, because universities are like cesspools of cynicism and despair. <laughs> Except for... Except for Gary's, the two Gary's, they're not like that. What else should I say? Do we have to? Um, well, have you got any questions? Questions about art or activism? Um, I started when I was about 10. And uh, the first activism I did was about cruise missile silos being built on common land in England. 
and um, it was women in, um, that occupied the missile silos. And one day we did get into a silo, and uh, we found actually a crucifix was taped to the missile. And so someone had got there before us, and they used to move the missiles around at night so they could never be targeted. And so really understanding that they placed the missiles on power sources, ancient power places. And then there were thousands of people would come to stop the missiles. So our whole lives have been one of struggle. Our whole lives have been one of resistance. And it's just being so positive that we have the solutions and we, we can do this. And in terms of that art I do, I'm gonna humbly say that I've used the abolitionist approach and that works. It works so well. When I'm just speaking with people, that's why I like it. Because it it's simple, it's truthful, and it gives people something they can do, it empowers them. Um, so the artwork is a way of um, making vegans, and it does. Because when I was a young artist, I could never afford even a postcard. I'd go in a gallery or museum, and you can never ever buy anything. And the one painting you like, they'd never have a postcard of. <laughs> so I always wanted to change that in the art world, to make pictures affordable and spread them around like seeds and that's really worked so you could do it with poems or cards okay you're getting bored now <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would like you all, please, to give a round of applause to these marvelous people. <laughs> you know, in 1985, I was a part of a meeting happened in Washington, D.C., amongst the, quote, leaders of the animal movement. And the idea that what we are all discussing is where do we go, what do we do? And, you know, what's next? And everybody, you know, sort of said what they wanted to say. When it came time for me to speak, I said, I think we ought to put all of our time, all of our labor, all of our energy, all of our passion, all of our resources into one thing, vegan advocacy. And people looked at me as if I was nuts, which I may be, but they nevertheless thought that that was an absolutely crazy suggestion. And they said, well, you know, that's just not practical. I said, no, it, it's, it's very practical. It's the only thing that's going to work. Um, I lost that, that debate or that discussion in that the everybody else in the room other than I wanted to promote animal welfare reform because animal welfare reform, you know, it wasn't good, but it was going to get us eventually to animal rights. And I said then and I say now, and I think the empirical proof is there, animal welfare, making animal exploitation supposedly more humane, which it doesn't do anyway, but supposedly making animal exploitation more humane is not going to end animal exploitation. All it's going to do is make people believe, it's going to make people more comfortable about continuing to exploit animals. I said that then, I maintain that now, I think it is clear. And I also think that had we put, the had, had we done what I was proposing in 85, had we put, think about this, if we put all of the energy, all of the resources, all of the labor that we have expended on Proposition 2, Cage-Free Eggs, Crate Free Pork, uh, Meatless Monday, and all of the bullshit that we've been pursuing for those 31 years, we would be well on the way to a vegan world now. And if anything, things have gotten worse. Things are less radical than they were in 1985. The, 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 
The energy of the movement is so incredibly reactionary. Basically, the movement has become an arm of institutionalized exploitation. Animal groups, every single one of them, every single one of them is basically a partner with institutionalized exploiters to make people feel better about consuming animals, exploiting animals. That's not going to work. That's only going to push matters. It's only going to push things backward. And that's exactly what it's doing. But there is hope. You are the hope. Okay? They are the hope. See, this ain't my struggle. It ain't their struggle. It is our struggle. And you know what? If we screw up, the most vulnerable victims on the planet will continue to suffer by the billions every year. It's time that this stop. We can stop it. It's hard work. It's real hard work. It ain't writing a check to some multi-zillion dollar organization. It's doing it yourself. But you can do it. You heard what these, all of these people, are you? We are all the same. These are people who, as Anna said, a lot of these folks are not natural speakers. I'm sure that a number of them were were very nervous when they were speaking to you. These, it's, not, it's not a natural thing to be in people's faces talking about however nonviolently they're doing it, however congenial they're doing it. It is still something that most people find difficult to do. And we all do it because we got to. Because if we don't, nobody else is going to do it. It's not my struggle, not their struggle. It's our struggle. I want to thank Bob Linden, I want to thank Anuj, I want to thank Michelle, I want to thank Julie, I want to thank Ben, I want to thank you. Peace.